Then, oh, uh, man, we didn't, well, red and pink, red and pink. Those are we need to color coordinate better in the future. I was going to ask you, I actually sincerely tried to voice text that to you, but technology and Kaylee have a hate, hate relationship. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Yay! Another I feel episode. like that music abruptly stopped. Does it normally do that, or am I just not paying attention? Um, I'm honestly not sure. Last time we rehearsed this, you told me to click it when it was at like three seconds because I think my internet lagged when we were practicing, and so it was like still going. But this time, my internet's not lagging, so I think it may have abruptly cut cut out. And that's my fault, guys. Yay! Yay! I like it when other people admit to taking fault. <laughs> Yeah, it's all me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, so we have a hello already from Los Angeles. Hi, Pablo. And a hello from Pittsburgh. Hi, Molly. I love it when people say hello. Okay, I also want to say, oh, Pablo's laughing at me. I'm way too excited, perhaps because I'm drinking coffee too late in the day again. Um, live production. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is live. Our viewers are reminding me that it's a live production. Well, no, they're saying that because I was talking about screwing up the intro music. Uh, yeah, but like, okay, I I feel, and I don't like to justify or explain, but that's why we titled ourselves We're Totally Not Okay, so that we can just screw everything up, but then lean into it hard as if we meant to do it, because we did mean to do it. Guys, it's part of our brand. Deal with it. It really is. You know what else is, I think, like actually part of my brand because I probably post half of like the pictures on my social media feed are of him. <laughs> Our guest today, who's one of my besties. I'm super excited that, because I will ramble on. We know that. I'll ramble on if I don't introduce who we have today. <laughs> but Mike Donis, uh, who I almost just started putting labels on him already. We know how Kaylee feels about labels. I already called him a bestie. I'm going to let him introduce himself with his own labels. Let's bring him on in. <laughs> this is cool. This is fun to be here. It's a little nerve wracking that it's live. All that, all that good stuff. But Welcome. that's okay or not okay or totally it's, not okay. It's not. It, it's actually not okay. I'd like, I want you to understand how not okay it is, uh, especially okay. since we're live. I'd like the nerves to be ramped up to... Um, what, what is it? The, the, the climax. We're not at an inciting incident. We're not at the beginning of a journey. We start in the middle of shit in media uh -huh. res. Are you afraid yet? Oh, terrified. Okay, terrified. Good. Well, first of all, before we get into how terrified you sincerely are, I know you are, uh, why don't you let all of the viewers who... Um, Pablo's also let me know that the view count's off, which kind of throws me off because I still don't really know what any of this means, but welcome to HAPS and we're learning as you're learning. New platform, let all of our viewers and commenters and audience members who are listening afterwards to the audio version, let them know who you are. And if you want to slap labels on yourself, go ahead. Sure. I, I, well, I don't mind labels as much as you do. And I'm sure we end, we will end up agreeing on the same thing like we usually do when we start from oh. a different direction, because that seems to be our thing. But yes. uh, I am uh, one of Kaylee's besties. And I'm also uh, a dude. I say, what, what what do I say from a from a profession standpoint? I I do things with and in pictures that appear to move because I work in film and TV on both sides of the camera. Uh, I'm a picture editor and director, and also an actor, and I do other stuff too. So um, yeah, that's sort of uh, from a professional standpoint uh, who I am. From a personal standpoint, I am still figuring that out. <laughs> Oh no, it's going to be one of those kinds of episodes, Justin. <laughs> hey, 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 they're the best. I love when you actually like go in to speak to an agent as an actor and they're like, list your skills. And you're like, oh Jesus, now I have to say like all the things that I can possibly do that are human. And you feel like an idiot, but they're like kind of personal, but kind of professional. You're like, I can snowboard if someone needs me to do that. Sure. Like it's a hobby, but I can make money doing that too, I guess, maybe. 
Totally. Yeah, I've seen I've seen loads of people. It's it's funny having conversations with friends who are actors and sometimes they'll 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 show you their resume or you'll see it for whatever reason and then you'll you'll have a conversation like, "Hey, can you can you actually speak in this particularly unique accent from this region of such and such and so and so?" And they're like, "Yeah." And, but it, but they say that they can. And and it's I guess I guess that ultimately is acting though, right? Fake it till you make it. Someone that they can do it regardless of whether they can, then that's just as good in some ways. Or is it? I, I love how your response when when being asked whether or not you can pull an accent off sounds like you have marbles in your yeah, as if you're trying to put every accent in your mouth at the same time with your response. Uh, <laughs> We also have a comment from someone saying, just don't pick your nose on this live broadcast and you'll be good. But the thing is, okay. is that you're also an actor and oh, I'd love <laughs> you are for our audio, for our audio listeners only. <laughs> really, God, you're missing out on the gems. This I just so picked his nose, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> But like committed to it. Now that's acting. Uh, <laughs> that's art, we will say. <laughs> Day 30 years from now, that that gonna haunt you. What's that, Justin? One day, thirty years from now, that freeze frame is gonna haunt you. Yes, it absolutely will. Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, I should, I should, I should snag that later and just use it. Like I'll put it on Tinder or something. That would be yeah, excellent. Maybe yeah. So exactly. you're leaning hard into it. Yeah. The thing is, I think that this is also why you have a lot of um, natural comedic value to you because. That is the tendency of a comedian, I find, is to recognize before anybody else, or maybe at the same time as the audience, something embarrassing like that, and then to make fun of yourself before other people do. Do you find that that <laughs> is true for your character? Yeah, my character, as in as in who Mike Donis is, you mean? Or because uh, yeah, I guess so. I think I think I would say I'm a self-deprecating kind of a guy. I sort of have have fun with. Uh, making fun of myself. I know my, you know, when you can make the best fun of someone that you know well, and I, I at least have spent a lot of time with me, regardless of whether I actually know myself well or not. So I, I know a lot of things. <laughs> that I can make yeah, yeah, we're going there. And yes, I did mean character as in that's who you're playing in this lifetime. But I mean, yes. if you remember other lifetimes, I would love to know if there's a continuancy there. <laughs> I, I would too. I would too. <laughs> In your dreams. Um, so there is actually something that still haunts you from 30 years ago. Um, and it's your newest production. And I don't know whether or not you wanted to lead with this, but I'm pushing it out at the forefront. This was, I think this is, at least to date, one of your masterpieces as far as a filmmaker. Would you not say that, what, what is it called? Shrinking? A shrinking machine. And, and it is, it's interesting, you know, it was something that I did a long time ago. And, and, uh, it, you know, back then I put all my heart and soul into it and I've gone back. It's been digitally remastered. Um, you know, it's in the original aspect ratio. It's everything about it is, 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 is as preserved as it could possibly be from my original vision at the time of making it. Right. And, uh, so I'm honestly, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy to get to present this. This might actually be the biggest audience that's ever, ever seen it. We'll see. I am super excited. Oh, yeah. I, Pablo can let us know afterwards that there's a way to see how many people um, <laughs> viewed you picking your nose and get to see this. <laughs> <laughs> so Pablo, let us know in the comments. But uh, without further ado, I believe Justin has that lined up. Let's Ew. see. Here we go. Are you ready, not guys? Dun, 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 dun. Maybe not. Yeah, there we go. Hey, guess what? I'm going to try my shrinking machine on Raphael, and I think it will work. But it won't. Um, guess what? The, did you see um, my Raphael? He really yeah. shrunk. Want to see? And look at Everything else is bigger than him, because he shrunk. I don't feel... Now I'm going to return him to his size. I, 
I, I am, I don't know how you did it. Um, I, I had the same sort of reaction to uh, when I watched, what's that movie where the girl gets yanked out of bed by some sort of evil presence and you can't actually see. Um, it's it's a scary. Like what's it? I feel like there's a lot of movies like that. Oh, that's true. Yeah, every horror movie. So I just, I'm comparing your film to every horror movie. No, I'm talking about the technicality of it. Oh, uh, Frank is asking who the DP was. See, these are things I should know. I'm trying to make a reference. I have no reference to the actors in it. I have no reference to the title. I have, I think it's a horror movie. It's like, <laughs> anyway, um, it'll come to me. But what I'm trying to get at is how technically inclined you were at, uh, that's you in the film, right? At that age? That is me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you filmed yourself. You were the director. You were the DP. Or maybe that's what Frank was asking. Who was the DP for your film? Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, where you got your knowledge and expertise at that age. Maybe let our audio only listeners know how old you were, because all they heard <laughs> were sound effects. They saw none of the visuals. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was. I was five years old, and uh, it was. It was at a time when. Uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids had just come out, so I was a huge, a huge fan of it, and I was just obsessed with the with the the, the magic acts of 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 the fact that these they, they got these kids to shrink, right? And so I can't remember. I'm I'm pretty sure that it was my parents who helped me figure out how we could kind of do do the effect. If I'm not mistaken, my father was the DP, and my mother was the uh, the the sound effects uh, technician. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's. Uh, that's who the who the team was, but they 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 helped me sort of uh, figure out figure out what you could do. I, I I had known that with you know if you make a cut and you move stuff in the shot, you can make it look like stuff isn't there or is or in this instance was bigger and then smaller. And they helped me sort of figure out how to how to do it. I don't think at the time, at least not yet, they would have let me actually operate the camera because it was it was pretty especially back then, like cameras were expensive. Like yeah. the fact that we had one was special. Like it was like, oh my gosh, we have an eight was millimeter on... tape video camera. Yeah, it was actually on tape. And yeah, it was one of those, it was, it was, I think it was eight millimeter or high eight. So it was an old format. I'm not sure if yeah. anybody's familiar with that format, but it was, a, it was like a home video format back in the, in the, in the early nineties. And, uh, and so the tapes, the tapes were about the size of cassette tapes that you'd play music on. And the, the camera was, you know, the size of a probably a professional movie camera, if you think about it. So there were, there was a big camera just because the tech was what it was. Well, what our, also our audio only listeners can't see is that uh, comment that just popped up from Pablo that, um, oh man, I, I can't even tell the difference between a thousand and a million, but there's a lot of zeros of how many people saw that, which we just put up on the screen. So I think he's also referring to when you picked your nose, but would oh, you sure. say that yeah would you say that your technical prowess has um remained where it was or <laughs> advanced in it? <laughs> have you learned anything since that film have you made anything else since i've done a few things since then um uh you know the odd the odd thing once in a while actually it, it started it started a whole slew of magic acts in movies i have I, I, I haven't seen them in years. This one I'd made a copy of a long time ago because it was the first movie I'd ever technically directed. But uh, there's there there are tapes upon tapes of it called Mike's Magic Acts in Movies, <laughs> Part One, Part Two, but and they went on for probably five or five or ten years while I was. Wait, why have you not showed those to me? Or I don't, we, I don't even know where they are. I know they exist somewhere. I'm sure that they're in in some some storage bin somewhere at one of my parents' houses. But oh, uh, I myself, you know I myself haven't seen them. But it was we did a lot. I, like I, I, I ended up figuring out how to do some stuff with like claymation and you, you yeah. video. I, the, the thing that I was most proud of that I need to find was taping like me like doing a fist fight, and then I, I put that on a VHS tape, and paused the VHS tape and put a, a, a some silly putty, and I made like a guy like an animated character, and then I used the video camera to film the television with the animated character on it and recorded a frame. And then advanced the VHS tape by a frame, and then moved oh the guy a frame. So it was like live action mix, like Roger Rabbit, like live yeah, action mixed animation. And it was pretty fun. That was that was kind of cool. But it was it was actually it was it was it's funny because at the time I had no idea that you could even do, you know, be make movies as a career. Like I wasn't even thinking of careers. It was just like 
this is just wicked. This is fun. I, I like, it's I like people yeah. thinking I can do things that I can't, right? It's magic. So I considered myself a magician, not a filmmaker at the time. Do you um, still consider yourself a magician? Uh, I, well, yeah, I guess in <laughs> sometimes, yes, depending on what, what project I'm working on, sometimes you're definitely working magic to make it, make it happen. Oh yeah. Um, there's definitely, I mean, they call it movie magic for a reason, right? So, and I didn't even connect that together until much later in life that that was always sort of what I was drawn to was just the wow factor of, of cinema. So you, you do label yourself still as a magician. Um, I can attest to that to how quickly you and I can make whiskey disappear. Uh, so, <laughs> and the fact that just, just to give, add a little bit of context so people understand what, what our relationship is like and to also understand a little bit more about who you are and who I am. Um, we not only cannot be in, we can't be together if we want to get anything really done unless we're on set because movie magic takes precedence over everything. We understand that we're professionals in those regards, but if we try to sit down and watch a movie, it not only takes us six hours to still not get through the movie, but I think it took six years for me to actually watch Jaws with you on your boat. It was, I think, actually, yeah, five or six years. Okay, wait, it was pretty so bad. We tried a few times. What's that, Justin? Why are we watching Jaws on a boat? Oh, well, I think we already know that Kaylee's afraid of horror films. She can't even, she has repressed the title of the reference she's trying to make. But uh, I had not, I was very sheltered as a kid, so I didn't see a lot of horror films. And um, some of the classics, including the classics, like Jaws and... Uh, that's just one of many films that Donna had sh shook and shaken his rough, just angrily shook his head at me for not having seen. And I promised that I would see it. And for six years, I was able to abate his, his proposals of watching it. Uh, I don't know how I did that, but finally six years later, um, and you can see the nautical pillow there uh, on his boat. We went to his boat and I don't know how you managed to not only get me to watch Jaws, which I'm still afraid of, but you got me to watch it on a boat. Oh yeah. my effing. And like there were spiders as well. Let's not were, discount the spiders. I actually remember how it was because it had something to do, if I'm not mistaken, it was after we had done Spooky Lagoon, which was a show that we did. It was a live event show that I directed and, and, and Kales was uh, was sort of the, the, the feature presentation of, of many of the nights. And uh, it was, it was a, a tour of the island. So it involved every single night getting onto a boat and driving over to the haunted lighthouse and being scary and doing scary things. And I'm pretty sure that it was at the end of it, you know, we'd been, we'd been hanging out for about like every day for something like three or four weeks at that point. Uh, and I think it was just like, well, if you can do that, you can you can watch a movie about a shark. And I, mean, I don't know that I would ever call Jaws a horror movie. To me, it's more like a thriller almost. But what is the difference between a thriller and a horror movie? Go. Ooh. Um, I I I think that's hard to actually uh, specifically define. I think that a a, a thriller can be a horror movie. But a horror movie isn't necessarily a thriller, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Horror, horror, I think, is about uh, about uh, using fear and the audience's fear and playing into or off of that or or, or what have you. Whereas a thriller is more about like um, the the high octane sort of getting your adrenaline running and stuff like that. And so they can be connected because because fear and 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 thrills yeah. are close, but I think they, I think they are different. They're, they're technically uh, different, different genres. Yeah. I think that, uh, well, I mean, especially these days we can equivocate it to the music industry. There are so many sub genres that exist now that it's challenging to just call something alternative. Like if I try to say what I used to listen to in high school, it was for the most part alternative, but what is that now? Like only green day and what happened to them? Because did they <laughs> wake them up when September <laughs> ended? Um, but as far as the horror genre goes, um, it, it, maybe horror is more of an umbrella that, or there's a Venn diagram where horror and thriller overlap, but I've always 
thought of horror to at least have a different demographic in terms of even the loyalty, the way that people immediately recognize what sort of expectations can be met from a horror film, that there is likely going to be something campy-ish about it. There is going to likely be a lot more gore. There's going to be jump scares. There's going to be tropes that we are expecting. Um, but because we are breaking things down into more and more subgenres, like the music industry, again, I don't know anything outside of alternatives, so people can shout those out in the comments. Uh, jazz? Is jazz alternative? Um, yeah. And I would say that thrillers are also, you know, you think about like, again, break that down into a psychological thriller. Now you're working more in an, uh, like the mind space of fucking with people. There you go. There's your, your response. You were asking before the show if we can swear. <laughs> I've already dropped an F-bomb. I'm getting French already. Um, <laughs> what's that? Oh, I just said perfect. I, 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 will, I will now start swearing nonstop. Great. I'm so glad all the children are going to go to bed now. Uh, we're all on Eastern Standard Time and it's pandemic times. People go to bed at 630. Uh, but as far as horror goes, I still, I have, I mean, we won't get into my stories of my experiences on my sets. We all know those, but I, I want to know, and I, I know a little bit, but I, I actually sincerely want to know if your heart lies in one particular genre and one particular style of storytelling, because like you said, we did a live play on Toronto Island. You deal a lot in film and television. You also wear so many hats as an actor, director, editor. You just took on a new full-time job as an editor. You have a lot going on. So as far as, yes, magicians at the top of the totem pole, but is there something that sits as a close second on there? Oh boy, uh, I don't know. Honestly, uh, that, I, I feel like that was several questions. Also, um, but in, in in terms of uh, so, like, is there is there a particular genre like that I, that a particular I like? project? If you could nail down your dream project that you can drop everything and you don't need to worry about money right now, what's the next thing that you want to go and make? Oh, I would love to, I would love to make actually a, a sequel to a to a, a a web series that I did a little while back, and uh, and it is like a, a there is I guess movie magic involved. It's 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 set in the future on the high seas, and there are pirates and laser guns and 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 all of this stuff. And I've got a, a screenplay that uh, that me and a, a couple other writers have been working on, and uh, it's there's there's a real heightened sense of reality. There's a lot of comedy and and uh, a lighthearted tone, but set against something that if it was real it would actually be quite awful and 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 post-apocalyptic but because of the way it sort of presents itself it's uh it's not and it's it's fun swashbuckling and uh that that kind of thing i mean in terms of what what attracted me to uh to movies i mean honey i shrunk the kids has that kind of a tone uh you know the star wars movies the indiana jones movies back to the future all of all of that stuff that was, uh, you know, modern or or just only a little bit old while I was a little kid. Um, that stuff, that stuff sort of shaped uh, how I how I see movies and what I what I that was that was what got me into wanting to make them. So I, I do appreciate the ability to not work on that stuff. Sometimes doing something completely different than that is also extremely fun. I find I find that it can be cool to to challenge myself and see if I can, like I did a, I did a short film uh, last year uh, with Laura Tremblay and, uh, and it's a, uh, it's just, it's like a road trip movie about a brother and sister uh, whose parents just died. And it's just, they talk the whole time and that's it. And it's not, there's no, there's no like special effects. Well, actually there are special effects, but it's not a special effects movie. Yeah. And uh, I think we actually have, uh, what do we have posters of each of those? Can we throw those up as Donis is talking about these? Cause I would sure. love people to have those visual references, and I'm I'm asking like the tech gods, aka Justin, because I don't know. I it's which posters are these? I got uh, it. So there's Pete winning and yeah. Scattered are the two films that he's talking about. This one's Pete winning that we have up on the screen. That is Donis. This and he's shaved his head. He has he doesn't have the same hair on his head right now. But right. that 
is, I love that shot. I've always loved that shot. And they're scattered where you did shave your head for it. Very different looks. Um, and yes. one is very, I, I, I think, uh, baby oiled. Are you baby oiled in one of them? Oh, there's there's fake tan. There's baby oil. There's makeup. There's there's loads of. I, I I'm ba I'm I'm actually probably about a centimeter thinner than the photo looks, just because there's so much stuff on my flesh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> the things we do for roles. That. Yeah. And and so that was something that you wore multiple hats on. So you're saying that you have a script, and I think I've read part of it. I don't know if I'm allowed to admit any of that, but uh, oh. you are <laughs> you are uh, the actor, director. You edited it. You you say that your next project, you want to be able to dive into a follow up for Pete winning this swashbuckling adventure. Do you have the same urge to wear all those hats again? Or if you could, would you just choose one? I mean, you're already sort of the face of it. So I put that I aside. have to be the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely the guy and I'm going to be the guy. And it's fun. It's fun to be the guy in the movie, you know, jumping on ropes and, and punching bad guys and, and stuff is, is always fun. Um, I would definitely, I would definitely want to direct it. Now, to, to, to clarify, the original one that we did, the web series, that was cut into a feature film, it's kind of confusing to go into the backstory, but we'll just call it a web series for all intents and purposes. But um, the web series uh, had three directors, so I was one of them, and then there was also Navin Ramaswaran and Jason Lieber, and there were, so it wasn't, it wasn't just me directing it, and they did definitely help out on some of the more, uh, some of the more uh, challenging days for me as a performer, I, I tried to ensure that that was one of the days that I had another director on set so that I wasn't also, you know, doing, doing all of that stuff. Um, but that being said, I, I would, I would love to direct and, and act in this new Pete winning. I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of my goal. It, it's, it's got a, it's got a sense of style that I really like. And, uh, there's a there's a there's a tone that I find really difficult to nail, um, and and that challenge of of doing it again and 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 especially doing it now that I have more experience as a director and as an actor and and in, in as a as a human being, um, I think that it would be it would be a, a great challenge and I would be the the man for the job to do it. When, when you say tone, are you talking about, uh, oh, first of all, uh, Frank says that he can definitely see Kaylee as a laser pirate. So <laughs> I, uh, you can technically, actually, if you watch Pete winning, you can see Kaylee's head in it for a brief moment. Oh, we that's barely how we even met. knew each other. We barely knew each other at the time. Yeah. Like we had met. Isn't I think, that how we met? I think that was how we like actually met, but we had technically met before because you, you, you obviously saw my post asking for help for people to show up. So we were no, Facebook. I think it was Ashley. It was Ashley Hallahan who was just like, "Hey, do you want to come out on, on set uh, for a day?" Oh. And so it was just one of those things that I'm kind of like, I, I maybe I did. I think okay, so I did know who you were. Wow, we're trying to. I don't know how, if we're going to be able to remember all this right now, but um, okay. I knew who you were, and I wasn't. I wasn't at the point. Yeah, I must have known who you were because I was not at a point where I'm like, yeah, I would love to go hang out and just do background work on yeah. somebody's set. Yeah. <laughs> and so the fact that I knew who you were and I'm like, really like that guy, but didn't really know him. Um, mm -hmm. And and that Ashley asked me if I wanted to come hang out and that I knew a couple of other people who'd be there. I'm like, that, that'd be fun. And I had, it was actually one of the most fun sets I've ever been on. <laughs> uh, especially as far as I think I've done two stints as a background performer, one that was kind of like just um, probably before that where I was like, oh, this isn't for me ever again. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I remember being, I think it was like craft. Uh, I was at craft. It was break. We're on lunch. And I, I think I had, no, I didn't have my tarot cards, but I was reading people's handwriting, like Chelsea's handwriting. And I was doing like reading um, spiritual readings of people's handwriting. And it was a lot of fun, but I, it was also just this day of being a pirate, like being in the background of a pirate's lounge and, and getting yeah. to watch you and Rose and Jason and uh, a bunch of people work their magic in this really cool world. I hadn't really been in that style or that tone of a setting before. And so to circle back to your, your use of the word tone, what I was going to ask is, 
do you say that in a sense of being able to nail the tone as an actor, as a performer, or are you talking about creating the tone overall in the picture as a director or as an editor? Uh, yes, I, I, I mean uh, in that overall macro sort of uh, cinematic sense. It's why I would want to direct it. Um, the reason I'd want to act in it is just because it is technically a sequel and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm locked in. I, I mean, I'm going to, and I'm, and I'm crazy enough to do all of the wild things that we ask the lead action hero in a low budget film to do, right? I'll, I'll do that stuff. So, so we get, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits having me be the guy. When you're actually juggling all those roles, how do you, how do you keep yourself sane on set? Like there's already a lot going on for a director. There's already a lot going on for an actor, regardless of whether it's big or small budget. Like there's a shitload of stuff happening on the set. So how do you actually keep yourself sane and how do you how do you plan out those days to make sure that you are getting what you need out of them but also not going home and just melting into the bed? I mean, well, you do that. You do do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but also, I mean, I, for me at least, I, I know that it's, uh, I, I, I find it, um, it can be overwhelming, but then you sort of, you, you, hit, you hit this point where you just, you do a lot of preparation work, or at least I do, and I, try, I kind of really try to have conversations with the the other key members of the team, like the the production manager and and the assistant director and the cinematographer and 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 uh, and the rest of the cast, and they all sort of know what we need to achieve. We're not we're not so much figuring stuff out on the day. A lot of it's been 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 sort of designed in advance, and so because of that, then it's 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 sort of a matter of going and, and and executing the plan rather than rather than sort of figuring things out. And so when you're executing the plan, for me, when I'm directing and I'm instructing people about how I want this shot to work or whatever, uh, and giving feedback to them and stuff like that, I just kind of step out and do it. And then it's like, I like step in and then I trust the assistant director and the cinematographer to, to say action and tell me whether the frame looked good and I trust had to trust that they know what I want to achieve and, and 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 when that happens then it's just a matter of I'll look over and I'll be like did we get it and then like Bruce or whoever it is it's the cinematographer will say yeah yeah we got it or no we got to do it again and then and then it's just like okay and then we just do it and sometimes I'd ask the the cast if they thought it was okay from a performance standpoint I found I found for getting performance feedback for myself to know how to redirect myself for the next take talking to the other actors because they're looking at you like two inches away right yeah and so so they see it like right there and they can tell you whether they believed it and and that was that was very useful uh to be able to to speak to them and again you just develop a a, a trust uh with them and i think that on on that particular project uh i, I I personally was super lucky to have a lot of people that I could trust and that were that were just as 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 wild as as I was in terms of what they were willing to do and and the the level of stuff they were willing to not accept in order to make our day happen. And so it all just kind of kind of worked out. I have a, a greedy question. Um, because, and I mean, most of my conversations with you, I'm very greedy. I'm like, hey, I've got this project and I want your advice. But you are somebody who has that kind of widespread blanketed experience from role to role and you're able to pivot so easily, at least from what I have seen from you. And you have such a, a wherewithal about how it all fits together. Uh, you know that I have an upcoming film and especially with Pete Winnie in particular, you know, it really does have a very particular tone. And a lot of that I find also is influenced by its soundtrack. And, and that is an easy way in for audience members to be like, okay, I feel that swashbuckling vibe because of the music. It's recognizable. It feels like Indiana Jones. You're on an adventure. And yeah. I hear you say that- Shout you out to have... Aaron Stang. Sorry, by the way. The yeah, no, that's exactly where He's I'm going this. with an insanely talented guy. Yeah. I want to hear about what your experience is like as far as the score goes. And if you, I think you did know your composer beforehand and I'm being greedy about this question because I don't know. I just signed on a composer for my film. We haven't actually gone to camera yet, but so I have time in advance to mm -hmm. communicate that. And 
I'm wondering, what do you do? What does that conversation look like? How do you communicate what kind of tone you want? Um, and and I know that it may, might sound easy as far as the swashbuckler, like you can reference something like Indiana Jones, but maybe in a more general way, how do you set up that communication? Well, uh, on that particular show, and 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 Aaron has scored many things that I've that I've directed. He and I have known each other since we were fourteen, so we go way back. We have Star Wars fan films from grade nine that we made together, and so the thing was that because he and I grew up together, and we we just we just knew each other so well, we have uh, we we have a way of communicating that can kind of finish each other's sentences and we kind of know what the other one's thinking. And I think that that definitely helped, uh, helped a lot. Um, and in particular, uh, it, it was super, it was super helpful for me because I could, I could also, if I, if I didn't feel I could necessarily explain what I wanted it to sound like, I, I sort of stopped talking in terms of what I wanted the music to sound like. Uh, shortly after we started working. Like we talked originally about, oh, it should sound like Star Wars. Oh, it should sound like this or whatever. But uh, but after that, when it came to how to approach the details of the individual scenes and like, is it going to be this kind of underscore or this kind of underscore? Um, it kind of got to the point where I would just talk to Aaron about what I wanted the the scene to do uh, thematically and, and emotionally. And then... He's just like a, an actual genius as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so he's he's so good at, at knowing, he's also a storyteller. Um, he, he helped co-write Pete winning uh, the storyline with me. And we've co-written many projects in the past. And so because he because he he knows story really well himself, we took the Robert McKee seminar together. And uh, back in the day, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, so he's he's able to sort of just listen to what I'm saying I want it to do emotionally and he has his own understanding of what uh, what to do as a filmmaker as a, as a storyteller yeah. cool. and right. pardon me oh I think that that was a feedback actually there's oh, was it? right now we, we've lost picture I mean our again our audio only listeners afterwards are at, at least I can still hear can other people still hear and if so in the comments let us know. I think our okay. faces are now back. Are we back? Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyway, he would just he would just he would just do his thing, and I would tell him what I wanted it to be like uh, emotionally, and he would he would find the musical uh, the musical language to express that. And I think there was only like one time in the entirety of like the ninety minutes of music that he wrote or something, where for this like one minute section, I wanted to remove the music and just have it play without music. Um, when he had originally written stuff, but for the most part, it was, it was, he would write it. And I was like, yeah, that works. Like, that is what I, that is what I want. And, and so again, it, it sort of, it sort of was a matter of that trust and, and, and knowing that, like, I knew that he knew what we needed to accomplish. And I knew that he had the musical understanding and the storytelling understanding to figure out a way to accomplish it uh, as best we could based on the footage that we had actually shot. And, uh, how how much back and forth was there? How long was the process? And how many spotting sessions did you do? How many uh, sit downs and, and and notes did you do afterwards? On on and I'm and I'm, I if I'm not mistaken, we did a spotting session of the first episode back when it was a web series. So the first like five minutes, um, and after we did that spotting session, the next time I came to see him to listen to to listen to what he had had written for that episode. He already had had been delivered the cuts of the other episodes and he had just sort of like done a, a, a mock-up of, of what it what it should sound like for the rest of them. And he was just like, what do you think about this? And it was honestly like, yeah, I mean, for 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 the most part, that's actually kind of it. So we, we then, when we did our second season, um, I don't think that we actually had spotting sessions before he composed it. There was literally just such a such a, uh, a a trust that I had in him that it was just like, here's what I want the the movie to do. Here's what I think we accomplished on set really well. Here's what I don't think we accomplished on set really well. So this kind of thing, in order to have the story have the impact that we need, might need to be enhanced uh, in in this way or that way emotionally. 
figure out a way to do it. And then he just, he just did. Cause he's that, a genius. Again, he's just, he's a genius, right? Like, so it became, it became the case that it, there, there wasn't much direction. So just work with geniuses is what you're saying. That's pretty much it. I, I do, I do my best to, to, to accomplish that as best I can. Uh, if, if I'm, if I'm the crappiest filmmaker on the crew, it's gotta be, uh, it's got to be a decent movie, and if it isn't, at least at least it's better than what I could have done. So oh, you're t okay. We're you're you're pivoting into something that I think that you and I spend way too much time on, but we will never figure it out. And I absolutely love that you're going there, wanting to be the worst player on the field. Like yes, especially when I go back to my football days, I want the glory, I want the ball, put it in my hands, and I want to be in the end zone. But first yeah. of all, hands like a fish, so don't ever throw it to me. I'm a running back. Second of all, I want to be on a field with players who are better than me because I want to be always learning. I, I want them to drive me to run faster and to push harder and to be more aware and to do my drills and do my training. And I feel the same way when it comes to filmmaking. I want to be surrounded by the masters, of course. I want not only to be a succubus and pull that energy in to be able to create with, um, but to be able to feed off of that and, and have that sense of uh, improvisation, the jazz in, in between, so that that magic that, you know, going back to the top of our conversation, that's where the space exists, I believe, for magic to happen. When you have that trust on set that you're talking about, and you have that kind of reverie, you have that kind of admiration for the other people that are on the field with you, who are on the set with you, because there is nothing worse, I think, or more of a hindrance than having um, holding those negative thoughts about somebody that you're working with that creates this block between you, the same kind of block you see on stage where you know two characters come up on stage and one says, oh, it's a beautiful day at the beach, isn't it? And then the second character says, we're not at the beach, we're in the kitchen. It's like, great, this is going to be a great scene. But yeah. that sort of blocking, I want to know, especially because you do so many other things, how that overall mentality of... Um, wanting to be around people who are better than you because it does drive you. How do you balance that with not, I guess, with the imposter syndrome or not being afraid of, say, walking into an audition when you're going in front of a huge casting director you've never met before or having, uh, who is it that saw one of your films? Like, there was a huge name. Uh, I think we were recently talking oh, about oh, uh yeah, uh, Jerry Jerry Brockheimer. Yeah. yeah, Brockheimer. So like some somebody like that, like that kind of an energy comes into your sphere where it's like, oh my god, this is a name. How do you balance that out and deal with that mental space for yourself? I mean, I am figuring that out. Uh, I don't honestly know exactly how to how to how to perfectly do that. I don't know that I have any any techniques. Um, I do I do find that it goes in in waves. For me, uh, I do sometimes no no boat pun intended, but um, I do I do I do have uh, the imposter syndrome thing come in a lot. Um, but then I also a lot of the time just feel like a rock star, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, oh, I, I can do this. Let's party on. Let's this is just amazing. Let's go. And uh, and so I I think for I think for me I just I just try to not I I try to do my best to feel like a rock star as often as I can. And so I know like lately, like one thing that I've been, that I've been doing is just to, just to try to keep myself clean and healthy. Like, like in terms of, uh, especially during the pandemic and, and, you know, being in lockdown in Toronto, living in a boat for months in the winter, it's like, how do you, how do you, so like, I, I've done, I've done lots of things. Like I changed my diet. Uh, you know, I take, I take vitamin supplements, uh, I, I, I actually, my friend Laura bought me a, a, a daylight lamp so that I always have like daylight. Um, you know, I try to go outside for walks as much as I can. I've tried to exercise more. I've tried to eat more healthily. I, you know, I've, 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 and this, please don't judge me on this one. I cut caffeine. And I know oh, too, that's a big you know, that's thing. Our show, guys. Really nice to have you. Uh, have yeah. a great night. <laughs> the, truth, the truth was, the truth was that I, you know, I was just reading because I was, I was wanting to circumvent having a really awful winter, especially because it was going to be kind of just living by myself. And so, 
I was looking up everything and I was like, well, one of the things that, that makes me feel sort of that imposter syndrome is a sense of anxiety. You know, like, it's like, you get this, you get this feeling. And I was like, I was reading up, well, how can you, how can you reduce anxiety? One of the things they, first thing they say is, is sleep enough and, 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 and get, uh, and, and, and don't drink caffeinated beverages. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do this. So I, and I was, as, as Kaylee, you know, and for everyone else who doesn't know, like I was a big coffee drinker. Like we're talking like there was, you know, at my best, it was six to eight cups a day. Sometimes. Oh my God. Yeah. And like I was, at your best, do you what, mean? Uh, I mean, at my worst, what, like what, as in at my, at my, at my, at my biggest need of caffeine. Oh and, God. uh, Obviously, that's not usually how I lived. I, was, I wasn't always hopped up like that. But but the, but the fact is, um, I can drink a lot of coffee, and I was definitely always always doing it. And so it was something that I made a conscious effort. And over the span of like, I started early. I think I started in September. I started I started mixing decaf with my regular caffeine into the into the mix that I actually brew, so that it would be slowly that's, weaning myself yeah. off and. By Christmas time, I was I was I was not drinking coffee anymore. See, I actually sincerely tried to drink decaf the other day, and it was such a big event for me that I actually tweeted about it. But problem is, um, most of my friends, including past version of Mike Donis, are such <laughs> caffeine drinkers that I had somebody actually responded. Uh, I, I said that I tried to drink it, but I opened up my cupboards and realized I don't buy decaf, um, so it couldn't happen. And so somebody <laughs> responded saying, because decaf is an abomination. And of course I had to retweet it because that is my love language. Like I, the fact that you're walking away from that, Mike, is just a little bit of a hindrance in our relationship. Mind you. We, what Justin? It's amazing how like out of all the foods in the world, coffee is the one that has like such a distinct culture and like loyal following. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the devil. <laughs> it's the devil yet she drinks it every day um what do you think my blood is now who do you think i am now oh my god don't worry man. i also don't drink coffee after like one cup i'm just jitters mcgee and can't focus on absolutely anything so i gave up trying long long ago and kaylee still hasn't converted me so there you <laughs> go so so you've never you've never drank coffee or you used to and then gave it up no, I've like never been huge on it. I really enjoy okay. like the taste of it, but I, I I cannot sit still. Like I actually vibrate. Yeah, well, that happens now. Like I I did have a after I completely weaned myself off. I uh, I I did have I, I went to a coffee shop a couple of months ago, and I did have a cup of coffee, and I was like, oh, I'll be fine, and I was. You know, like the, 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 I was feeling yeah. it. like it was like it was this really weird. I, I went home and I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm going crazy. Like I, I, I was squirrely. It was weird. And I was like, man, this is my body had adapted to that being the normal. No wonder they say that it gives you anxiety. Right. Right. Because like that's the, the, you're just your 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 body pumping things and moving at that rate. And even just me speaking like that now, just to, to you know, uh, clarify how I felt. Just saying that is making me. You're just feel. trying to play. That's you playing me. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, yeah. How, did I pass the audition? Was it good? I mean, you've got a couple of contenders. I have had that happen in improv shows where people like when you ghost somebody, when you try to play the version of, uh, of whoever else is on stage and every, that's exactly people's go-to when they're me. They're just like, absolutely. I, everything has to come out of my mouth really fast. I'm going to move like a bumblebee. And you can't really get like, especially with a platform like this, where it's like, where'd you go? <laughs> it's just a blur. But yeah. I think I'm adapting maybe just because my really a, how do you talk that quickly? And B I'm still amazed that you crushed that football analogy earlier. Like I'm still <laughs> so in awe right now. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, then you're still just getting to know me. You and I have known each other now for a couple of years, but maybe you don't know how hardcore of a football player I was in high school and university. Yeah, sure. yeah I I was like, okay, I came out the second girl and my dad said, fuck it, put cleats on her and put her on the field. I think he wanted a little boy. And I played every single sport except for the one that would make me Canadian. I never really played hockey. I have a set of hockey skates I never really used. I also used to speak so incredibly quickly when I was a child that my mother actually had to slow me down and teach me how to enunciate my words. And that is still a challenge for me, especially with the amount of caffeine that I drink. But dude, I live for the footballs. <laughs> I tried out for the football team, lasted one day, and never again. 
all, I just threw out all my, uh, my medals. I like MVPs up the yin yang, but all the pictures that I have associated with it are me with, um, uh, I don't want to call it a mushroom cut cause it looks more like a circumcised penis. I had cut my hair <laughs> really short in my final year of high school. And so, uh, we'll pull them up. I'll, I'll share them. I have not you. seen this photo and I feel like I have. Oh yeah. Oh, we'll share yeah. that. <laughs> Um, okay, we we are already sucking up so much of your time. Uh, we do have, I still have a topic that I want to get to, but before we get to that, let's hop into one of our fun games that you actually emailed answers to in advance, um, our two truths and a lie. And do you want to read them out or shall we? I, uh, let me find them. If you have them ready, maybe you should read oh, them. Oh, I have them ready. I'm prepared. I've been drinking I coffee. I don't. I don't prepare. The 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 art art can't be prepared. Oh Jesus! The man who prepares to be both director and actor for days before going on set. Yeah. <laughs> Drop an Easter egg of the exact topic that uh, I he knows I want to get to because we yeah. we spent hours on the phone the other day on, on a Zoom call about it, whether or not art can be prepared. Okay, let's. Yeah. I have them in front of me. Your two truths and a lie. <laughs> I am going to read I them. I yeah. what what's that? I don't remember what they are, so please do read them. Yeah, I can't remember what I put. Perfect. Maybe you won't remember what's true or not. Maybe you lied about all of them. Your been. two truths and a lie are. Mike Donna says he can do 500 sit-ups in one go. He says he can that he sleeps underwater. And he says that he has been making films for 30 years. So I feel like I might have a bit of an advantage knowing you super well. Um, but our audience members don't. So if you feel like jumping in and want to... We should start having prizes, Justin. We should have prizes. <gasps> And for those of you who are listening to this podcast after it happens because you're not joining us live, remember that we do this live on YouTube and Twitter and on haps.tv, which is best. So check it out. Um, we do, it's on live on YouTube right now too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. Wow, this is final cast. This is, this is epic. I didn't know that. I thought it was just here. That's I didn't know it either. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so we have somebody guessing in our comment section right now on HAPS. Frank says, A is untrue since he probably sleeps below the waterline in the boat. I mean, I see now he, I feel like everybody knows you as well as I do now. Yeah, oh, that's, that's uh, yeah. Going, going against Mike here, A, we did just play a video of him as a kid making a movie with his parents. And then that's B, true. we talked about him living in a boat in Toronto and trying to stay sane and healthy. So I feel yeah. like, I feel like you revealed too much too soon, Mike. I did. I did. That was bad writing. That was bad writing. Bad writing. Honestly, yeah. that's on Kaylee and I, though, because we probably should have started with Two Truths and a Lie then. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, we're learning, whatever. But you know what? It's also super fun to, sometimes you just you set them up so that the audience can knock it out of the park. And that's a real feel-good feel, right? That's Wait, true. So, that's Wait, true. so is A the lie? Number oh, one. I don't know. We haven't even answered yet. Is A, so again, to read okay. it, A, I can do, and by I, I mean, now I'm impersonating Mike. I can do 500 oh, yeah, sit-ups in one go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. I can do, A is I can do 500 sit-ups in one go. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting more caffeinated by trying to be him. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm reverting to the old version that I know. Previous uh, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> previous Mike. B is I sleep underwater. And C is I've been making films for thirty years. So the lie. A is a lie. Okay, so our there's audience. No way, there's no way I could do five hundred sit-ups. There's no. I, chance. I mean, what about your Pete winning days? What yeah, you come on, swashbuckling. Well, I guess. Well, you know what? Maybe back then. Maybe back then, but I ain't as good as I once was. Well, that so sequel, you're gonna have your work cut out for you. Oh, I will. That's the real reason I want to make the sequel. I just want to make sure that I can get back into shape. And have the production pay for it, please. Come on. Yeah. Perfect. There it is. Yeah. That's the only reason why I make art. It's like, uh, then I can actually, I know I have to be held accountable to be a human being that can be seen in the world. But most of the time, I just want to play a gremlin anyway. Please cast me as a gremlin. Write a gremlin into your script. I've been begging you for years. <laughs> Um, okay, so now to hop back before, and, and we won't. We'll try to keep this still uh, under. We're, we're, we we have a couple more minutes. We're we're gonna keep it around the hour mark. 
But cool. um, you alluded to exactly what I'm still obsessed with and and was listening to an Alan Watts lecture earlier today. So of course it came back around in my memory. Mm-hmm. Art. Is it in the doing or is it in the result? Is it an act oh, or no. is it metaphysical wickets? <laughs> yeah. And the trouble, the trouble with these topics, Kale, is that like we have these conversations all the time. But the trouble is, I'm, 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 you're much more educated than I am, and you're definitely much. But, but I think that we're just as passionate as each other about our opinions. Mine, mine are, mine are coming from a less educated spot. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just feeling and and, and thinking it. I'm like, no. Hey, what so happened to treating yourself like a rock star? You good, bud? You good? Oh, I'm passionate. I'm just saying from an, I'm, I'm just factual. I'm not. I know that I'm not educated. I don't, I don't, I don't listen to Alan Watts things. So, but, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's the be all and end all. See, this is also this is the differentiation between um, my friends like you and other people who I understand that my energy is like an elastic band and are thusly on the opposite end of being repelled and not necessarily drawn in magnetically. Um, you treat that like it's a great thing. Everyone else is like, she's she's touched. She's definitely touched. Well, I think that too. <laughs> It's it. It does. It can be both. It can be both. Which, by the way, is also I think my answer because it's funny. Ever since we had that conversation about whether art is in the doing or in the product, I've been thinking about it a lot. I haven't read any articles about it or seen any 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 anything podcasts or anything. But I've been thinking about what I think, and and I do. I think the answer is both because I do. I do. Uh, I think it's both. I think it's both. And I think that things can be can be both things. Sometimes. So my question to both of you then would be, can you have one without the other? Oh, oh. Are we doing, okay. or doing without, without the art, without the end product? You are, you're going to break my brain because now we're going to get into time and whether time is a construct or... <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing is, is that if art is and what we were arguing just so that we can clarify it for our listeners and for anybody who wants to chime in right now in the chat section please feel free to add your opinion as to whether art is in the doing the act or if it is the result the product which understandably from a business stance a business point of view i do i get it movies are products A, a novel is a product there is a finished product that is then marketed and even marketing can arguably be an art form. Let's let's not discount the fact that how many educational institutions make an insane amount of money off of teaching that as a craft, essentially. But I look at art as, um, a- a- at least the way that I like to appreciate art is in the process. Like even when it comes to watching, when, when it comes to watching something, if I'm not enjoying it enough that I am, you know, jumping off the couch and and shouting for, you know, Tom Brady to run the ball and not be a wimp. And, (laughs) or if I'm reading a book, it's, or especially poetry, poetry, I think is the perfect example because yes, poetry is something that can be considered an end product. It has been translated or transgressed or transcribed or transmuted through this transfiguration of a human being being the vessel and I don't know, reaching towards pulling it from the ether, pulling it from source, from God, whatever you want to call it, from the muses. And that act of having something pass through the medium, through the vessel, through the poet, that in it it itself is what I find, um, I can lose myself for days in that process and Mike can attest to this, some conversations where I am so hopped up on coffee because I've had nothing else for days. I have not slept for days. I have tried, but I then realize I actually just spent three days covering my apartment floor with what I call floor notes that are also insane. I'll share those as maybe that's my one cool thing today. Um, (laughs) But that process of being lost in it, in, in making, in, in, being affected by the muses oh my god it's ecstasy it's um close to sex for me but when it comes to selling something you it's so challenging for people to 
to, I think, be able to sell that. In, and and, and the, I think the differentiation, the problem here is, is the selling because we have now commodified art and that steps away from, I think, the essence of it. It is a simulacra. We live in a world of simulacra, a version of a version of version. So who's to say, and let's not get into NFTs right now. Oh, I think that's a whole other conversation. Are you, saying, are you saying that the product of art has to be sellable? No, I'm saying that no. art is the joy that the ecstasy that you do experience whether you are reading the, that the product is the process the um, art is the process oh it's kind of like you know the You're journey the journey egg here what you're arguing a chicken or an egg here. Yeah, it sort of is. And and I and I also think this is slightly different than what the topic was that we were talking about the other day. Too. I think it's I think this is going a little farther down a different a different tangent of it which which I also as we anticipated. I don't I don't disagree with the thing that you're saying in the sense that the like for example, what we were talking about before uh, was can art be planned? Can it be something that's planned? And 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 at least this is what I remember was that uh, I was saying yes, you can you can you can plan it, and then you can you can it, there's still there's still a, a live element to the to the performance or to the experience of the person uh, listening to the music or, or or looking at the painting or watching the movie or whatever. Um, but then there's also planning involved, like like when when. Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. He didn't just like do it. You know what I mean? Like he he knew what he was he knew what he was going to do before he did it. Did what he made know? Him, I oh, I have a hunch that he did. I don't know. I haven't talked to him. So to be fair, I should <laughs> I should see if I can get a hold. Maybe you guys could get him on the next one. Yeah. yeah. That, if anybody that'd be, that'd be really there, if anybody out there knows him, aka Kevin Bacon, if you want to get your six degrees on this and maybe bring Da Vinci on our show, we're open to considering it. But I feel like the inspiration, it, what I understand you're saying is that the inspiration is the art, not necessarily the result of that inspiration, but that the result of the inspiration is proof of the inspiration. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think we are, again, having the same, this it's is one of those things. Yeah. yeah, we're having the same argument. It's just kind of from a different angle. And I think Justin's hitting the nail on the head as far as the chicken and egg argument goes. Yes. Because it's it's a very Buddhist approach of, you know, living in the now versus um, considering future and past as a part of whatever it is that we deem art to be. Um, Wait, so in this conversation you guys were having, Kaylee, were you saying that you, you couldn't plan art? I was saying that's not where art lives. Art does not live in the planning and then the product. Art lives in the moment. That art is an. You're basically the saying the art, the art is the ability to be flexible and and go where it takes you. I think art is. Um, it's not necessarily just the ability to be flexible. That is a component of it for sure, a facet. But the way that someone moves across a floor or the way that someone sips their tea, I think can be artful. The way you live your life. It's the way. It's the how. It's the... But are you not subconsciously planning how you're going to sip your tea? Like when I go to grab my water bottle, subconsciously, my brain has said, your hand is going to move to that water bottle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're also very good at, okay. I think Justin has to be present for all of our conversations because he yeah. seems to be a very good mediator and he's getting us closer and closer to the reality of it. You <laughs> are not, um, there, there's something that is instinctual about being thirsty and reaching out to your glass of water and drinking it. And there is something that can be considered sort of planned or learned or rehearsed because you've done it a million times. And this is a good equivocation for acting. I think you can, easily smell the farts on stage if you can tell that an actor is pushing if, it, if an actor is not actually believing that they are in that moment that they're doing what they're doing and, and thinking what that character is supposed to be thinking and you know if they've planned it too many times and it feels calloused or they don't even really know what they're saying they're just okay, okay wait, 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 wait so you're telling me that both of you have never had that moment where you're performing and your mind is like, oh, when I get home, I need to do this and do this, even though like the words or, or the instrument you're playing is just kind of gone on autopilot pilot because you've practiced so much. You're saying that you now have to actually embody it in the moment instead of being able to separate yourself from that? 
No, because I would I would say that that is absolutely something I would do, and I would especially say that coming from it uh, from an editor's perspective, because I know for a fact that what actually you're watching in the final film a lot of the time is not necessarily the take that the actor did their best work in, but it was the take that could cinematically convey the art yeah. of the story to its highest degree, and. And it may not on its own have actually been something that anybody on set thought was good, but it's something that because of the exact moment that happened in the exact juxtaposition based on the exact context of all of the other images that are being collected through planning, yeah. uh, that then that now becomes its own thing. And it wasn't something that anybody had planned. Although arguably, I suppose you could say that the, the editor or the director had planned using it and that was why they said it was okay so maybe it's their plan and it's their art that it now works but but it definitely absolutely is is the case that the results can still be uh engaging and beautiful and 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 honest um in terms of in terms of its expression and the interpretation of it uh without it necessarily having been felt that way by the person that you would uh purport to be the artist Yes, and yes, and yes. Frank <laughs> just said, art spawns flow, endorphin, serotonin, dopamine. I love that we're getting into the scientific ways in which our brain is connected, you know, our, 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 our nervous system, that feedback effect of uh, even the play of our emotions. And I agree with what you're saying, Donis. Um, I, 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 yes, I sit on both sides of the fence still because... Yeah. I think you would also admit that there are moments where, you know, you just don't, you don't feel like you were there. And as a performer, I've heard this so many times from other performers as well. It's like, I just wasn't there. And I have a coach who says, doesn't matter the way that it read on camera works. And mm -hmm. since art is also subjective, it also means that the audience member is coming with their own experiences. Right, and whatever you signifier. Here we go. Foucault. <laughs> We are going to get a little bit into uh, Carl Jung, Man in a Symbol. Yeah. I'm joking. I won't. Uh, this is the education that I don't have. See, I just, I just, I just think it. It's fine, Mike. You don't need it. She's, she's just. <laughs> doing it all. It's 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 so it. Here we go. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that we could spend another how many um, lifetimes talking about the fact that it's yes and no, and it's all of it and nothingness, and I'll send some more Alan Watts videos out to the ether. Uh, I love Frank's comment. The word flow, though, it's like a, a the way that runners talk about getting into the zone. I think it's that same space, that feeling, but it can be felt either by from the performer. It can also be felt by the person who is consuming that art. Art is now. <laughs> And on that note, it's time to wrap this up with our one cool thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I already said mine. What did I say mine was? I don't even remember. I, yeah, I Kaylee's reaction. Right. I, I sincerely don't remember because that's how in the zone and flow I was. But I did, <laughs> I did actually sincerely, this is going to be um, so... I'm not lame. You know what? It's not lame. And I'm doing a disservice already to my nation because I'm doing this in, in the name of being Canadian, but jeans, I have an obsession with jeans and I don't think I've done enough credit for jeans. And I think I did a bit of a promo on last episode for jeans, but the Canadian tuxedo, I would just like to come back in general. So if more people could wear more jean, that would make my heart happy. I, I wish that we had prepared that photo of us in a Canadian tuxedo each at that film festival. Remember when we did that and we yeah. looked awesome? I do remember that. Oh, yeah. that would be really, okay. I'll, I'll see if somehow we can share that with we'll the rest that goes out. It, it exists somewhere guys. <laughs> yeah. Your one cool thing. Do you remember what it was? Yeah. Yes. So my, my one cool thing is something that I do every day to try to not uh, go bananas. And, uh, and that is to make sure that I wake up way earlier than I have to. So in a perfect world, I don't have to be anywhere early. But that rarely actually ends up happening. But I'm always awake a minimum of two hours before I have to leave the house. And I spend the first hour doing literally nothing of importance. And I used to drink my coffee during that hour. Now I don't drink coffee anymore. So I just kind of sit there and I don't do anything. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll 
watch YouTube videos or I'll just do things to like get visual stimulation, but I, I just kind of sit and wake up and it lets me feel like when I'm starting the day, I'm not starting the day in a rush. And if I'm not starting the day in a rush, then I feel a lot more calm and, and, and sort of, sort of mm -hmm. centered and stuff like that. And so that's a little trick uh, that I think is cool that I literally do every single day. And it's, and it can get ridiculous. If I have to leave the house at five, I'm up at three and I do that. So. You do? You sincerely yeah. see that if you have to get up? Wow. Sometimes, sometimes if I'm like dying and it's like the fourth day of it, I'll get up at 3.30 or 3.45, I guess. But mm -hmm. that's only in a special circumstance. In a, if, if I have my way about it, it's two hours before I have to leave the house. I feel like I do something similar, but like um, <laughs> here, and it, and it is, I guess, a two hour process. I usually, whatever time I have to actually be at my desk working, uh, it's, it's not like it's a far travel because we do everything at home now, but I still set my alarm for two hours in advance. And, um, but my routine, because I know my routine is, uh, I have two different sitting practices that I do meditation practices that I do. And one is very short that I usually do like as my water's boiling for my tea that is after the coffee that I have already immediately raced for as soon as I got out of bed. Um, okay. And then my second sit practice is between like 10 and 20 minutes. It, it's still, it's not a two hour process. Um, sometimes I'll include yoga beforehand before I go to my desk or sometimes I'll do it later. But lately, because I know it's actually only, I don't know, half an hour or so, I've been hitting the snooze button and I still get like the things I'm supposed to get done, AKA my meditation sits in, but I'm not getting up in that. I don't know why I give myself two hours. I don't need it. So I'm <laughs> setting my alarm to just interrupt my sleep now. <laughs> Justin, what's your cool thing? My one cool thing, I'm going to go along with your meditation and you're sitting and doing nothing because you no longer drink coffee. Um, but I've actually recently gotten super into drawing. I, I think I've talked about it before, but I have a bullet journal and I've been doing it for about like, I don't know, about two years now, which is actually insane. I actually have a record of two years in my own handwriting of like shit I'm doing, shit I need to get done. Like it's absolutely, it's kind of cool going back and like time capsuling it, but yeah. I've recently started drawing and through that I recently, every once in a while I'll steal one of my parents' iPads. And, and like use a drawing app and make digital art. And it's super fun and I find it super meditative. So if anyone out there is like meditation sucks, it's not for me, I would say give drawing a go because you might surprise yourself. It's it's pretty freaking awesome. Do you find that you're in the flow when you do that? Is it art? Oh, it. You are done. This episode <laughs> is over. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Wait, 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 wait. Paranormal activity. What about it? That's oh, that's the movie you were talking about. Yeah, when the girl got sucked out of the bed and I couldn't remember, I, like it, what scared me the most was the fact that I could not figure out how they did that. Oh, I just got a Creative Genius Award. Thank you, Frank. I love this. I'm ho I'm taking that personally. I hope it was because I remembered the title of that movie. All right. Without further ado, thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. And come back uh, another time. I'm sure I'll see you soon since we hang out weekly on our Zoom calls. But we'll just yeah. make you a regular guest here, too, because we have more to talk about. <laughs> I'm down. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. If you like this podcast, you can support it by subscribing to it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also leave us a rating or review, which sincerely helps us and we absolutely love. Come hang out with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and send us your questions, recommendations, and cool things at we're totally not okay at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to We're Totally Not Okay, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs>